Good morning. Welcome to this teaching service this morning. I have a few announcements. Serve Day will be on October 15th. I don't know exactly the projects yet. We'll have more information for you next Sunday. But if you're able to serve that Sunday afternoon after services, we could use your help. On October 29th, there'll be a church picnic here. That's usually in conjunction with Trunk or Treat. So if you're into that, a picnic, uh, sometime we ought to make it a potluck, but I know he's very anti-potluck, so we'll have a picnic. This is the 55th anniversary of this particular building, the sanctuary, today. So 55 years ago, this was started in this sanctuary. This last Wednesday, a longtime member, Bev Rasmussen, died. Um, we're going to miss her. I, she sent out cards f- for every event and every occasion. She was very diligent in that and uh, missed that already. Dave Schmidt's birthday was this last week. So if you can make his day by saying happy birthday to him, or better yet, singing to him. Uh, I wish I had a tape of me singing, because that would drive him up the wall for his birthday, but we don't have that. Um, That is it for announcements this morning. So let us begin this service in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read in 1 John chapter 1, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. After honestly examining ourselves, admitting our mistakes and omissions, and relying on God's word, we can be assured that we have forgiveness of all our sins. Upon your confession, our confession, I am happy to announce the grace of God to all of us, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, all of our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The teaching. We have a song. We will sing Crown Him with Many Crowns, Lutheran Hymn 525.
Good morning. We are glad that you're here today. We are grateful. We are in Romans chapter 11 and Romans chapter 12. But before I begin, it is my understanding that Micah had an 18th birthday this past week. And Micah, you wanted me to sing really loud for you. Isn't that what we talked about? No, we did. Oh, you're okay with it. Micah, come on up here. Come on up. Yeah. Do this with me. Micah, 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 Micah. Micah. So we're going to sing happy birthday to you. You okay with that? Oh, yes, absolutely. All right, let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Micah. Happy birthday to you. God bless you. Yay. I'm always impressed, Micah, you can grow facial hair, and I am 61, and I cannot. It's just not a circumstance I've ever had the ability to do. So we're in Romans chapter 11 and 12. I make note of these three things. I say this frequently to you about the book of Romans. The book of Romans is a blank slate. He's not answering a problem. So in other words, what he writes there is significant to note. This is the fourth section. It's between the fourth and fifth section. The first section is the law. That is, we are all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The second section is the gospel. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We all live now in sanctification because of Christ. Then is new Israel. What do you do with the Jewish nation ultimately? It says then in verse 11, chapter verse 1, I ask that God reject his people. By no means. I'm an Israelite myself. I'm a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know that the scripture says the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets, torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I reserve for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if it's by grace, they cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. How is anybody right with God is really the question. If I might be so bold, how are you right with God? So my last name is Schrank. I am German, not by my own doing. I'm German. I was born right. That's uh, genetically in predisposition in my family. Everybody in our family thought they were right. It was always an awkward dynamic when we had two disagreement, two differing points of view in the same room. This is the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, for instance. Lots of people are last name Schrank and Schmidt and Schultz. Why? Because everybody came from Germany or Saxony back in 1830s from the Prussian Union. They were saying, you can't worship the way you want to worship. So they became, in essence, German pilgrims like Plymouth Rock. But from a German standpoint, they came up the Mississippi River and they ended up in St. Louis. Because that's where the big portion of people are. Sometimes I meet people who think they are connected to God because grandpa or grandma was connected to God or mom and dad was connected to God. Now, here's the real truth. You have to believe for yourself. It says it's by grace. It cannot be based on works. It can't be on what you do. It can't be on who you are. If it were grace, if it if it were, grace would no longer be grace. And if you go on to chapter 11, it talks about for us, we are the ingrafted branches. We are those who trust in Christ. Look at verse 13, the second page. I'm talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry and hope that I may somehow arouse my people to envy and save some of them. For the rejection that brought reconciliation to the world will be the acceptance, but be life from the dead. If a part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, then so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among others, share in the nourishing sap of the olive, do not consider yourself to be superior to these other branches. This has to do with the question of, do you have false spiritual pride? So years ago, I was a vicar in Wyoming, 
a little town called Burns, Wyoming, on I-80 between Cheyenne and, and uh, Pine Bluffs, if you know where that is, on I-80. And there's a white church, clapboard church, and I re- we would have picnics after a clapboard church in the grove of oak trees to the, to the south side of the church. And one particular day, there were two little kids who were screaming at each other, no, I did it, no, I did it. You see, this oak tree dropped acorns, and these kids would collect acorns, and they would then plant acorns. And in their mind, they had planted the acorn two weeks before, and that tree popped up because of that acorn. This tree is now, you can't get your arms around it. It's been around for a very long time. And these two little kids are arguing, no, it was my acorn that made this tree. No, it was my acorn that made this tree. And we can chuckle about that issue because we say that's silly. It's not logical. That's the nature of spiritual pride. We can't claim before God, God, you owe me. God, I I deserve something. In fact, the language is, look at verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. That's a harsh word. The intention is we must have humility that God has delivered for us. If I might be so bold, I grew up in a family and some people in my family trusted in the gospel and some people in my family did not trust in the gospel. And I would often ask myself the question and ask God the question, why does it seem so clear to me? Why is it not clear to this person and this person and this person? Why is it possible that they can go through their whole life and think life is about something other than what it really is about? And Candidly, the conversation that came back in my mind to be convinced of is, but Jeff, God has, I've made it clear to you. You have to, and over the course of time, many people in my family have come to understand and believe, but not at first. It says, verse 25, I do not want you to be ignorant of the mystery, brothers and sisters, that you may not be conceited. As Israel experienced a hardening, part of the full number of Gentiles has come in. In this way, all Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come from Zion and will turn the godless away from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when they take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. As far as election is concerned, they are loved on the count of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Well, God is still seeking and saving, wants to seek and save everyone. Look at verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have you ever been caught in a why? Just been caught in the why? Why? Again, can I tell you, I was caught in a while. I'm a middle child, grew up in a family that sent me to Lutheran schools because there was danger in public schools. And I used to think, God, why couldn't I have been born into Billy Graham's family? If I was born in Billy Graham's family, it would be a lot less tension. But I wasn't. And ultimately, sometimes we get caught in the why when we should actually get caught in the why not. Why not? Do you ever watch the news and you feel sorry for somebody on the news that something tragically happened to? And you have some level of fear, well, maybe that will happen to me? Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgment has passed beyond tracing out. I have good news and bad news. The bad news is you don't know everything. Turn to the person next to you and say, I got bad news for you. I don't know everything. I got good news for you. God does. There is a fundamental humility in recognizing that there are some things that are way beyond us. And then chapter 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This chapter 12 is now, how then do we live in new worship? I urge you, in view of God's mercy, not because you're afraid, To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Um, My old car died. They wanted $12,000 to fix it. The car was worth $350 maybe because it had new tires maybe. I I wouldn't want to pay them $12,000. So I went to my mechanic. They're great people. They've kept my cars running, these jalopies running for decades. They sold me a car. It is a... Ford Explorer looks like it's brand new 
It's 10 years old, has 193,000 miles on it. Drives great. The only problem with it is people think I'm a police officer. That's what they think. So I can never figure out going down 51, why is everybody going lower than the speed limit? And I look, the only thing that makes sense is it's me. So when we, on Wednesday mornings, we come here for giving out food. Wednesday mornings, I leave the house at about 4.15 to get down here by 4.30. And every car, it's 4.30 and it's 4.15 in the morning. Who's anticipating a speed trap at that time? All of a sudden, everybody's slowing down. I can't figure it out. And then I look, it's me again. It's a fascinating thing. Have you ever had this situation? You see some speed trap on the right-hand side. Everybody slows down. Then about a half a mile beyond it, everybody speeds up. How many of you have ever seen that? Right? I'm not going to ask you whether you did it. I want to see if you saw it. That's all I'm asking. It says, in view of God's... See, we are moved in view of fear. I am an excellent individual when the pressure's on. Like, I crammed all kinds of things in my head during college overnight. I was able to divulge all kinds of things. And my frontal lobe was filled with all kinds of information, put it on the paper. The next day, if you would ask me those very same questions, I had not gotten back to the, had not gotten back to the written recesses of my brain. But I knew how to play the game. The deadline caused me fear. God says it shouldn't be about fear. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. All you can give God is what you have. And he says, therefore, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We had three Japanese students living with us for those two weeks when we were welcoming this from Yorawa Lutheran School. And... Um, I don't like eating things that I don't know what they are. It's a, it's a thing. I don't, no offense, those of you who like sushi, it's wrong. You shouldn't be eating raw fish. It's a wrong thing. You should cook that fish. Sorry, I'm glad you like it. I can't eat it. it causes me a gag reflex. And somebody says, oh, I want to, you should eat some eel. Nope, I ain't doing that. Sorry, you can bring me, you can invite me to your house today. I'll try to be polite. But if you have eel, now that we've had this conversation, I am not putting it in my mouth. It's not happening. Because in my mind, I'm from Wisconsin, and when you're from Wisconsin, the only thing you think of when you think of eel, you think of leeches is what you actually think of. And I have no particular interest in eating a leech. These young ladies were in our home. We were trying to be kind. My wife says, you have to eat whatever's in front of you. Oh, dear me. And when you don't know what something is, it's very hard and it's difficult and they would say, we talk about food a lot. And they would talk about in their country, in fact, they had a system by which they would have watermelons have the ability to be grown as cubes and not spheres. Okay, and you say, how does that work? They put it in a, a mold and let it grow inside the mold. So that when you cut the watermelon, it would be like the size of a piece of toast kind of a thing or a big piece of toast, that kind of idea. Here's the issue. When you stick a long enough time in a mold, you eventually will look like it. God says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be molded by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What you think about matters. Now, I'm not going to ask you what you think about, but God is asking you what you think about. The thing that controls your mind matters. The renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing. If you want to be a living sacrifice, your thoughts matter. And he goes on to say this statement, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. I apologize to tell you this, but if I'm the first person to say that, I, this has helped me because this is church. I need you to turn to the person next to you and say, I'm sorry, but you're not all that. Say that. We're not all that. That's the concept. We should look at ourselves with humility. We either can be humble intentionally or we will be humbled for sure. For it says, it goes on to say in verse 4, For just as each one of us has one body with many members, these members do not have all the same function. So in Christ, we though many form one body, each member belongs to all the others. We are a group of people who are connected to each other. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. 
If your gift is prophesying, that is speaking the word, then speak in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, serve. If it is teaching, teach. If it is encouraging, give encouragement. If it is giving generously, then do it. Excuse me. If it is giving, give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So many times I've had conversations with people and the end result of the conversation is this. Why am I here? You really boil it all down. It has nothing to do with what they spend their money on or where they go. Why am I here? And sometimes people try to avoid that question by distraction, by this activity or that activity. But consider this issue. When God answers the question to you why you're here, it could be and should be a portion of the spiritual gifts God has given you. Have you been the gift of, given the gift of prophesying? Do it. If you're serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. Encouraging, encourage. Giving, give generously. Lead, do it diligently. Show mercy, do it cheerfully. It does not mean you will always do that and everyone will clap. But it does mean it's why on earth you're here. I believe, in fact, our culture wants us to be distracted from spiritual things. And they have lots of fancy plastic things outside. Now I want you to look in this next series. This is a concatenation of imperatives of what to do. I want you to think about people. Do you love the world? You're going to say, yes, I love the world. It's the specific people in specificity that are more difficult. Now when I say this, who's specifically difficult for you to love? Someone's coming to your mind right now. Maybe it's me. Sorry. Pray for me. It's good. But when we love, it must be sincere, to sincerely love. Hate what's evil. What's evil in this world, hate it. Run from it. Cling to what's good. Hold on to it. Be devoted to one another in love. Who are you devoted to? Who would you do anything for? Honor one another above yourselves. Who do you lift up above yourself? I love verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Don't give up. You know the word enthusiastic, to be enthusiastic? The Greek, it comes from the Greek word entheos, to be in God. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And verse 12, be joyful in hope. To be joyful even as you wait. Are you waiting for something to happen? Be joyful even as you wait. Patient in affliction. Are you, deal, are you carrying something right now that's heavy? Be patient in the midst of it. To be faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now let's stop for a moment. If you live this long in your life and no one's been cruel to you yet, I wish I could tell you it's never going to happen. But it does. And those are the things of our life that attach themselves to our soul. But God says to the people who, who are mean who are cruel, who are hurtful, God says, bless them. Don't curse them. And he goes on to say, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Can I say to you, I want to honor the memory of Bev Rasmussen today. Bev Rasmussen was almost 90 years old when she left this life. When we came here almost 24 years ago, she and her husband, servants, 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 after he went home to be with Jesus, she took over the, the prayer ministry. And sometimes two and three times a day, you would have emails that would talk about praying for this person, that she was a faithful individual. And when my wife and I actually had the privilege of just seeing her just a few weeks back, went to her daughter's home and listened for quite some time to what's all happening in her family. She was quite clear. And her her encyclopedic memory of details was impressive. So this turn happened very quickly. And she went home to be with Jesus on Wednesday. And we do both things. It says, this statement, we rejoice with those who rejoice. We rejoice for heaven. Honestly, I can't wait for heaven. But I know I need to wait for heaven. Then it goes on to say this, but weep with those who weep. And I mourn with those who mourn. I mourn with the Erasmus and family. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. 
Verse 17, similar, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of anyone. Let me ask a question. How many of you have a sibling? How many of you have ever punched your sibling? How many of your sibling has ever punched you? How many of you ever had this exchange? I had older brother, younger brother. We would punch each other frequently. It was part of life, unfortunately. Um, I didn't understand that everybody didn't act that way. I had no sisters. So there was no real gentleness in our family. It was all deal with things physicality-wise. And so when my brother would punch me, then I would punch him back. He would say, you punched me harder than I punched you. And he would punch me back. And then I said, you punched me harder than I punched you. And eventually we would all just end up in our room for... I remember months at a time, one particular time. I felt sorry for my mom. My mom deserved a medal. If you can imagine three versions of myself in the same building or in the back seat, my poor mom, to be honest with you. Re do not repay anyone evil for evil. We thought we could just even it out. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If you want to be annoyed by people, you can. Look, we could, before you leave today, we could each give you a piece of paper and you could say, what are the ten things that annoy you? I think you could do it. I think you could give me a list. But it says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do you know the name David Jeremiah? Do you know this name? David Jeremiah. I heard a sermon by him 20 years ago that impacts me still to this day. And he talked about this issue, that in a cycle, in a family, there was one person who did something to another person, another person did it back, and they went back and forth and back and forth over the course of generations. And eventually he said this, in order for it to stop, somebody had to absorb the pain. I find that to be powerful. I'm not suggesting we make excuses for people's sin, but I will say this. The language it says, as far as it's possible, depends on you. Live at peace. Don't take revenge, dear friends, but make room for God's wrath, for it is written, it's mine to avenge, I'll repay, says the Lord. You know, revenge, almost a third of the movies on Netflix and Amazon Prime are about revenge. Look that up. The, the subtext as to what's it about. Do you, know, do you know the name Liam Nielsen? Do you know that name? I have a certain set of skills. You know that guy? Almost every one of his movies is about revenge. It is his. God says don't take revenge. But leave room for God's wrath. God will do it. Those who are cruel to you, those who have treated you poorly... Those who continue to treat you poorly, give it to God. God, I give it to you again. It's mine to avenge, I'll repay, says the Lord. And then you have verse 20. On the contrary, instead of just letting God have it, in fact, he says we're supposed to do something. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. What? If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. What? Are you kidding me? In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. I think it's also, here. somebody said this to me some years ago, it's helpful to me. Um, I'm a middle child, which means I have a keen sense of fairness. Sorry, that's just a true thing. And so I often wanted to see what was fair and what was right. But I'll say this. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. When you go the extra mile, when you turn the other cheek, when you give your cloak and coat as well, I want you to think of one person today that it's hard for you to be around them. It's hard for you to feel in your heart right toward them. God actually says, do the unexpected. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Picture a Kingsford charcoal briquette for a moment at, at peak temperature. Gold. I mean, it's a kind of glowing. Picture you holding that in your hand at peak temperature. It will change. It'll distort your palm. But picture now putting it in the middle of your forehead. It will change the middle of your forehead. That's what it's saying. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on their head. They will not be able to figure out why you are being so kind when they know sometimes that they're being so cruel. It's a strategy. It's, it's a strategy that takes... You can't say, look, I'm heaping burning coals on you, so you better be nice to me. That doesn't work out. That isn't how it goes. You give it to God and say, God, God is, in God's economy, he will take care of the revenge question. 
Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. My, uh, my family and I, we went to Newport Beach, California for five days over the summer. So my kids and grandkids and we rented an Airbnb there and we spent time building sandcastles, which don't last, by the way. They don't last. Um, and so the, the lifeguards would tell you whether you could go in the water or not. And if you couldn't go in the water, the flags would be out and the riptide would be carrying people out. You know how a riptide functions? Riptide functions because it will push you all the way out. You will exhaust yourself and you'll drown. The only way out of a riptide is actually not going against the current or with the current. It's going sideways. Get out of the current. Don't be overcome by evil, the current. Don't be sucked under. But overcome evil with good. I ask you this question, what's the theme of your life? When you have time to think and no one's going to tell you what to think, what do you think about? How do you categorize the th difficult things that have happened to you in your life? I'm going to say awkward thing, but there are things you can control and things you cannot control in your life. There are people, I don't know if you can control any people, but there are people who treat you kindly and people who do not. But God says to you, do not allow underneath all of it to be overcome by evil. But rather, overcome evil with good. Because if you go back to the very first verse of this last chapter, therefore I urge you, parakaleo means to, to call out to God. Therefore I urge you, I, I call out brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Sanctification or how then you live is, God, I give you what I have. I have this level of energy. I have this level of intellect. I have, I have this level of time. I, I have this level of emotion. I give you what I have. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, maybe I'm talking to one person today. But I know some people who, no matter what age they are, they are caught in the current. They're overcome by it. Have you ever met anybody who almost every time you talk with them, what comes out of their mouth or their life actually is negative? They're complaining. Now, they might have reason, humanly speaking, to complain. They've been treated poorly, and they're, list, they're trying to find someone who will listen to their tale of woe. I'm not suggesting that we can't bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I'm saying there's a difference between giving it to God and being sucked under by the current. Offer yourself. You're saying, but Jeff, you're telling me what not to do. What are you asking to do? Some days I have 100% of energy. Some days I have 30% energy. I can only be, give what I have. Some days I know exactly what to do. Many days I don't know what to do at all. I can only give what I have. That's what God is saying to you. He's saying offer your body, your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I have good news for you. God does not want to waste this day for you. God does not want to waste your life. God wants you to offer to him again, God, I give myself to you again. I give my life to you again. I give my time, my effort, my energy again. Please give me your favor that you might bless it. I love, especially chapter 12, because there are so many things there that, in fact, we can get caught in. One last story. From Wisconsin, family lives in the, my grandparents lived in northern Wisconsin. My aunts and uncles lived in central Wisconsin, dairy farmers. And so if you ever drive around Wisconsin, there are two-lane roads everywhere. And in two-lane roads, there are people who are so close behind you, they want to get around you, but it's curvy. You can't do it. 
And so the idea is there was one particular time where I could see the person who was tailgating me so well, I could tell you what kind of dental work that person had as they were screaming at me in the thing. I was trying to get as far over as I possibly could. I was just trying to do it safely. They wanted to get around me so badly. Eventually, I found a place to kind of pull off. And I pulled off after much frustration. I'm going to confess sin here now. About a mile down the road, that guy got caught by the police for going too fast. As I went past, I went like this. Yes! I was so happy there was justice. That was sin. I, I get it. It's still a sin today, but I still was so happy about it. I still am happy about it, honestly. It's, it gets bad. It is not my responsibility to seek revenge, nor is it yours. God, this is yours. All I can do, all you can do, is to give God your very best in this very day. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray your grace and your peace and your strength to be upon us this day. May our love be sincere. May we hate what's evil. May we cling to what's good. Bless us, Lord God. Bless us as you continue to give us precisely what we need in this day. We gather all of our prayers before you in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we close with our benediction, I, wanna, I want to welcome especially our guests from Grand Canyon University. Can you guys just stand up for a moment so we can clap for you, these young people? Yeah. We're glad you're here. Uh, three of them are from the St. Louis area, and one is from here. We're grateful that you're here. God bless you. Receive the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We have our closing song.